Hi, and welcome back to uh, Applied Portfolio Management. My name is Patrick Boyle, and I'm teaching this course. And this is class number three. And so each of these classes is roughly an hour long. And uh, if you haven't watched the first two videos, it probably makes sense to watch them first. But anyhow, um, in today's video, we're going to be talking about equity investment management. That's kind of our big topic of today. And we'll be talking about how people manage equity investments and uh, you know what the approaches are and what financial theory is used and so hopefully you'll find this interesting and useful so traditional asset management is the professional management of assets to meet investment goals that's kind of what people have traditionally done and so as i mentioned in lecture one uh, that this whole course is sort of broken into two parts one part is traditional asset management and the second half will be alternative asset management and a lot of my expertise is in alternatives i've worked most of my career in the hedge fund space but i equally have worked in traditional asset management as well and so hopefully can give you a few insights into what people do and why they do them and so asset management just to be clear usually refers to collective investments it, it's someone managing assets for a group of people rather than maybe just uh, managing their own portfolio their their own retirement account or assets and then we've got terms like wealth management or private banking and those are terms for managing uh, assets often for wealthy individuals within a large investment bank or an asset management company and so that's a big business that has been around for a long time um, so the first thing we should probably talk about when we're going to talk about asset management is this idea of the efficient markets hypothesis that many of you as students of finance will have heard about already and it's almost one of the first things people ask me about when you talk about being an active asset manager is you know does it make sense to to actively invest or should you invest only in an index fund and I, I'm larger I'm going to allow you guys to decide that for yourself but we'll just talk through the pros and cons of the the different approaches so the efficient markets hypothesis is an, an idea that's been around in academia for quite a while and there's kind of three forms of the efficient markets hypothesis so the first one we'll talk about is weak form efficiency uh, which essentially is that prices cannot be predicted by analyzing past data so what that really means in plain english is just this idea that technical analysis does not work that's the that's the weak form of the efficient markets hypothesis now uh, many of you probably know what I mean by technical analysis but if you don't technical analysis is this idea that you can look at a historic price data or the charts of uh, of stocks and you're, you're able to work out from uh, patterns within those prices that you can either see visually or maybe analyze with a computer um, how the that stock is likely to perform going forward so it's sort of a an idea that the the past price behavior is predictive of future price behavior and so the most basic form of the efficient market hypothesis does argue that 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 idea does not work now the next form is what they call the semi-strong form market efficiency and that that is firstly includes the idea that the technical analysis doesn't work but it also uh, adds to that that prices adjust instantly to all publicly available information and that essentially means that fundamental analysis doesn't work so they're really saying with this that not only is there no, no uh, benefit to analyzing the the price data the price history of a stock in order to make predictions but even if you look at the fundamental data if you analyze the accounts and things like that of companies you still will not have any sort of an edge uh, because the price adjusts instantly to any new information so the minute the company will say the CEO of the company announces that business is going well and that uh, you know more orders have come in uh, than, than usual at, at this time of the year the price instantly will move to a new level because everyone who has heard that data will have adjusted their positioning and so even knowing that information is of no help to you that's semi-strong form efficiency 
democracy. And, you know, that, that is uh, an argument. And then the final version, the strong form efficiency, argues that share prices reflect all public and private information. So that's adding in the idea that even insider information wouldn't help you out. So if you knew, um, if, if you were friends with the CEO and they told you they, they had just, uh, you know, brought on a huge new customer and they were about to double their uh, market share in a, a given business, this uh, strong form efficiency is telling you that even if you ran out and broke the law by using that insider information to invest in that stock, um, that, that you wouldn't benefit from it because the price not only does it rec not only does the price uh, uh, adjust to uh, available information, but it should have adjusted to even this this information that's not available to the public. And you know, I, I think that's really a rather questionable argument. In all honesty, I think in fact it's interesting as a, a, you know I'm sh shooting this video in March 2020 when the whole coronavirus uh, thing is going on and. Uh, there's all sorts of scandals at the moment. I believe there's two U.S. politicians uh, that that are uh, in a little bit of hot water because uh, essentially they attended a few meetings where they were told about the spreading of the coronavirus and the likely impact of it. And I guess both of them rushed out and liquidated their stock portfolios right before the market fell about thirty percent. And um, and so the, the question, you know, that's in the press today is whether whether these guys broke the law or whether it's appropriate what they did. And once again, I'll allow you to decide uh, what your thoughts are on that topic. But, uh, you know, I think it's fairly clear that that having uh, had that information that wasn't available to the public possibly gave them a, a reasonable advantage in their in, in their investments and I, I think you know all of these areas of uh, the efficient markets hypothesis um, I'll allow you to think through whether you feel they're reasonable or not you know I've got here at the bottom that for efficient market hypothesis to actually make sense, it does require that people analyze this stuff. So it's sort of a, a chicken and egg problem in that if you're going to argue that you don't need to do any of this analysis because it'll already be in the price, you have to realize that the only way it could be in the price is if people are paying attention to this information. So in a way, if you're saying that there's no point in analyzing the accounts or listening to uh, you know, an earnings call from the CEO because it'll already be uh, reflect uh, that the market will move instantly well someone must have bought in order order to move the market instantly to reflect this new data and so there there must be um some benefit to to uh, doing this analysis now maybe you have to be the fastest trader or something like that i'll once again allow you to decide on that but um it is required that there be stock pickers and that there be analysts who pay attention to this data in order for prices to be efficient. Otherwise, uh, you know, there, there would be nothing uh, tying the price of a stock to the fundamental uh, data or there would be no one paying attention to, we'll say, statistical patterns in price behavior. Or uh, once again, this, uh, you know, there, there would be no profit associated with insider trading, which um, you, you have to assume that there is a profit associated with insider trading, otherwise they wouldn't have made it illegal. Um, but anyhow, that is the efficient markets hypothesis, and that's a big idea in finance. And it, it's something that is frequently discussed, and a lot of the argument around indexing is tied to these ideas that if, if there is no advantage associated with doing all of this work and this analysis, well then a smart person would just buy all of the stocks. They'd buy a basket of stocks, invest in that, and they'll do well when stocks in general do well, and they'll do badly when stocks go down. But there's, there's at least they're not wasting their time, I guess, on, on doing all of this research. So that is the argument of the efficient markets hypothesis. Now, when people do, if you work as a professional investment manager, there's many ways of doing this. And so I'm just going to, there, there's a lot of things I'll talk through in today's class that just relate to different ideas that 
different people have. Now, I have a, a particular approach to the markets, as does almost anyone who works professionally in the markets. But, um, you know, we're able to look at all of these things. And I often argue to students when they say to me, should I be this kind of investor or that kind of investor? I often say to them that sometimes it relates to your personality type. Like if you're, we'll say, for example, if you're the type of person who loves picking around and finding like, uh, you know, cheap things to buy, well, then maybe you should be a value investor because maybe the way your brain works is, is best applied to that. While if you're sort of a person who's always looking for the exciting new thing, maybe you should be a growth investor and try and work out what the latest, greatest technology is and invest in that. Or you should work in venture capital and pick the cool stuff of the future. But, you know, none of these approaches is necessarily better than another. They're often maybe just uh, better suited to your personality or to your beliefs as to how markets work. Um, so, I've got here some steps in equity portfolio analysis. And the first one we have here is this idea of top-down analysis. And that's really that a lot of investors, if they're investing kind of long only, in, traditional investors, long only investors in the asset management space, they'll usually start out with some sort of an economic point of view where they'll look at the markets and the economy in general, and they'll say, you know, we're, we're at this point in the business cycle, or, um, you know, this is is what's happening in the world right now and the best way to position myself is and they'll they'll uh, finish that sentence and so a top-down analysis involves coming up with some sort of a macro view, uh, looking at both local and international markets, looking at things like foreign exchange, inflation, the business cycle, things like that, and deciding, we'll say, for example, if you feel you're in a, a period of rising rates, you might then want to find stocks that do well in a, in a rising rate environment, or if you think uh, that there's going to be... Um, you know, uh, growth in, uh, uh, you know, the, the markets are moving in the direction of greater outsourcing. Well, then maybe you want to invest in emerging markets or, you know, something like that. But essentially, it involves taking often a macro view to begin with as to what the overall economic picture is, and then working your way down to stock selection. So once you've come up with some sort of macro view, the next step is often to work out how best to express those views. Because you've decided, we'll say, for example, that we're uh, entering a recession or just finishing a recession or, you know, wh whatever you might have decided, you then say, well, in the, in the forward-looking market environment, like looking forward, what is likely to do well? If I believe that interest rates are likely to rise in the future, what kind of stock should I buy? And like what businesses will do well in that environment? So that's how to best express those views. So step one was this macro point of view where you work out where we are. And then you say, well, if I'm right about that, then the best thing to do is, and that's the next step. So then we move to bottom-up analysis, which is really detailed security analysis. So we'll say, for example, if you've made a decision that uh, with, with uh, something like the coronavirus, you've decided that you want to invest in healthcare because that's going to be the big thing going forward. Um, you then need to say, well, how do I do it? Like, do I want to invest in, uh, you know, drug stores like CVS? Do I want to invest in uh, hospitals? Do I want to invest in drug companies or whatever it might be? And once you've decided that, then you have to pick which one to invest in. And that usually involves some sort of fundamental analysis where you are building maybe a DCF model or something like that in order to price all of these stocks and try and find the ones that you feel are best priced for, uh, for you to invest in and hopefully make money. So that is our bottom-up analysis, which is just detailed security analysis where you work out which stocks you're going to invest in. And then we come to our last bit, which is portfolio construction. And we talked a lot about that in yesterday's class. And it's the use of financial theory to produce 
an efficient portfolio because of course once you've you've now worked out what your macro point of view is how to express it which stocks it makes sense to buy the next question is in what proportion should you be buying those stocks and so that's when you're doing portfolio construction where you try and work out the best risk reward uh, portfolio that you can put together in order to uh, have a, a good payoff with limited volatility and so that is the steps of uh, equity portfolio management at least rather quickly so the macroeconomic forecast that we talked about there's of course many many ways of doing this and there's no you know i'm not a, an economist um but you know probably the the best approach in performing a macroeconomic analysis is to look at all of the big macroeconomic things so we've got things like fiscal policy which is how governments are spending and often that will really move the needle for certain companies right if a, if a government decides to really get behind a certain industry for example that that can really be good for that industry and maybe when a government makes a decision like that they stick with it for a reasonable length of time you know so things like fiscal policy how a government is spending might uh, might impact uh, how you're going to invest but not only that just how much is a government spending so when a government will say is moving to a plan of austerity for example that just means there will be less economic spending and that might uh, you know shrink the economy and so uh, equally if they move to an idea that they have to spend more in order to stimulate the economy this will move the needle as well what else have we got monetary policy so what's happening with interest rates are interest rates going up or down um, often they tend to trend a little bit in that in that usually when a government or when a central bank hikes interest rates once they do it again it's it's not that often that you see them moving it up a little down a little up a little down a little and so to a certain extent looking at monetary policy and trying to work out what the likely future monetary policy will be might be very useful for, to you in your your macro analysis uh, other things like demographics so even the age of the population and uh, how how the population are likely to spend their money at various uh, points of uh, of their life you know so in different countries there's just really quite different demogra demographics you look in Asia for example I think India has one of the youngest populations in the world and then you look at places like Japan or Italy and they have the oldest populations in the world and so older people might be moving towards retirement they might uh, you know be starting to to draw down their savings uh, they might be spending more on things like health care and less on on other things like uh, you know the the things that a, a, a youthful person might spend their money on and so that is obviously worthwhile uh, analyzing as part of your macro analysis lifestyle changes so People change the way they live based on various uh, economic effects and it's worth trying to analyze how people are changing their lifestyles and how this will affect the overall economy. Things like technology, you know, new technologies come along and they change all sorts of things. And we've seen that throughout history. And so that would probably be part of your macro analysis as well. And finally, politics and regulation. These are things that can really move the needle. And often when uh, a new government is brought in, they might, uh, you know, you might move from a right wing to a left wing government or vice versa. And the way a government is spending and, and even the people, the, the segments of society that they're focusing on will change. And as that changes, uh, that, that might affect which uh, stocks or which parts of the economy are growing or shrinking. And so that idea would maybe be part of your analysis also so that's kind of a good early step in uh, coming up with what a reasonable portfolio might be for an investor so here we've got this little chart of the business cycle um, and it's something that many people have you know heard about and talked about and it's it's kind of I would argue it's one of these things where it's sort of useful and kind of not useful as well in that as you can see here we've got this almost like sine wave type growth you know where there's recession trough recovery recession trough recovery peak and the market's kind of going up and down in this predictable manner and in the real world the problem is that it's difficult to say 
where you are at any point in time. So even if you decide that this is how uh, the business cycle works, um, you know, often people think they're in a peak and there's five more years of peak or five more years of growth before the actual peak. Or people think that, that uh, you know, the recession has only begun and in fact, it's about over. And so, you know, it's, it's a useful idea and you should, you know, in order to decide how you're going to invest your money, people, of course, think about this they think about well we'll say even uh, you know if you're 10 years into a recovery maybe you say well recoveries don't last that long maybe it's time for a, a downswing but as I'm saying it's it's not always as you know the, the problem with a chart like this is it makes it look like it's really easy to do and in the real world it's not and also uh, you know the, these tend to be you know a full economic cycle might be a 15 year thing and you only get so many full economic cycles in in your investment career and so the problem is that maybe by the time you've worked out uh, you know how how to uh, pick where you are in the cycle maybe you're at the end of your career but but anyhow um, this is the idea of the business cycle and of course if you're deciding where you want to invest or how you're going to invest it's worth thinking a little bit about that so um, what should you invest in in these various areas well there's all sorts of ideas that will say in, in a recovery you want to invest in cyclical stocks and commodities in expansion you might want to be in things like stocks and property uh, in the late expansion you might, might want to be in interest rate sensitive stocks in a slowdown you might want to be in bonds or defensive stocks and in a recession you might want to be in dividend paying stocks or bonds you know so the idea is that if you could predict uh, you know the coming environment there might be an optimal allocation to to different types of investment that uh, that you could pick um and so that is that idea so uh you know what falls into these groups well we've got here cyclical so a cyclical stock is one for whom earnings tend to follow the business cycle so these are companies that do well when the economy is booming and they do poorly when the economy slows down so you can imagine just things like um you know steel and autos heavy equipment that kind of thing because obviously when things are booming people might go out and buy a new car when in a slowdown they might buy a used car or just hold on to the car they have um, steel might be used in all sorts of construction and so on because if business is booming maybe new factories and uh, office buildings are opening and shopping malls and so on and steel is required for that and heavy equipment for building so those would be six cyclical stocks which are ones that are expected to follow the business cycle defensive stocks are ones uh, whose earnings are insensitive to down Turn. So we've got things like utilities, you know, like water and power utilities and things like that. And you tend not to reduce your spend on these things, even in a slowdown. Things like pharmaceuticals, you know, people don't usually buy medicines because the economy is booming. They buy them because they're ill and they need them. And so and things like grocery stores and so on would be considered defensive stocks. And that means that they are companies who are not that sensitive to how well the economy is doing, that they're going to kind of trundle along and do all right in most economic environments. And so a portfolio manager needs to think about what stocks that they think will do well in the coming economic environment, because it's not necessarily all about, the question isn't, what is happening right now the question is what is likely to happen in the next uh, few months or years ahead it depends obviously on your holding period but you know what's happening right now is less interesting because that's sort of uh, as soon as you've identified it it's in the past right but you you need to kind of be trying to work out what the the likely environment of the future will be like and thus which stocks or uh, investment products you should be in so 
when do changes occur? I kind of like this cartoon. We've got the, the bull, you know, for a bull market on stage here and the bear waiting in the wings, ready to come out and uh, someone saying, not yet, not yet, you know. And so the, the, the idea here, you know, when do the changes occur? It's, it's always hard to predict, you know, like often when, uh, when things look their best, uh, you know, things are about to change and when things look their worst, they're about to change as well. And, it, you know, I, I think often when you're a young person, you look at market history and you think you would have known all these things were going to happen but when you're there it, it doesn't feel so obvious like even at the moment um, you know the stock market has fallen significantly about 30 percent over the last few weeks because of this uh, coronavirus and also the oil shock that has hit the markets and we look at that and uh, you know you ask yourself well how will the market do in the next uh, six months 12 months five years, 10 years. And, you know, it's not always that obvious. Um, it seems way more obvious when you look back and you go, oh, well, during the credit crunch, it was obvious that things were doing too well beforehand and then they fell. And then, then it was obvious they were at the bottom and the only way was up. But, you know, I remember having conversations with a lot of smart people before and during the credit crunch and you know before the credit crunch people thought that things were uh, you know that we were in the early phase of an economic expansion and uh, at the depths of the credit crunch there were many very smart people who said you know when we looked at the S&P 500 which had fallen to around you know I think the low was 666 and uh, you know people looked at the market at that level and they said well it's it easily in a week's time it could fall to you know 500 400 400 you know uh, people people often uh, it, it's hard to distance yourself from what's happening right now and obviously when the market is down it's usually because there has been a lot of bad news and when the market is up it's usually because there has been a lot of good news but as to whether the good news or bad news will continue it's a, a lot harder to to decide on that so when do changes occur it's a little difficult to say. Um, I often warn students to be a bit careful with this idea of bull market and bear market uh, because often you'll hear people say, you know, there's, there's a very famous book um, called Reminiscences of a Stock Operator and I should have put that on my reading list from a couple of days ago. I'll probably put a link to it in the description below. Um, it's qu quite a good book. About, it, it's it was written, it was sort of about a guy, I think he, it was the name in the book might have been Larry Livermore, or La I forget what it was. But anyhow, it, it was basically, it was about Jesse Livermore, who was a famous stock speculator in the in the 1920s. And, um, you know, that there was a character in there, I think his name was Old Man Partridge or some, or oh, I forget what it was. Anyhow, the guy, um, his, his, the whole thing was, you know, if people said like, sh you know, uh, should I buy or should I sell stocks? He'd say, it's a bull market, you should be long, or it's a bear market, you should be short. And the problem is, you know, this idea that if the market is going up, it'll always go up. And if it's going down, it will always go down. That's obviously not true. And so often, you know, when people say a bull market, a bull market is usually defined that the market is 20% or more above its recent lows. And a bear market is, uh, you know, 20% are more below uh, a recent high and so um the problem with that is that maybe the move has already occurred by the time you've decided it's a bull market or a bear market or at least you've missed out on 20 percent of the return so i would you know it it's up to you what you, you think is reasonable or not. But I would say that sometimes the problem with a lot of these ideas of uh, what should I do in a bull or a bear market is that it assumes that you know that, that because something has happened, that that's what's about to continue to happen. And we don't actually know that. Um, so I'll leave you with that idea. Um, so on to fundamental analysis. So fundamental analysis really means analyzing the accounts of a company in order to work out how they're doing and how valuable the company is or not. And th this may seem like a very obvious idea, but it actually is only, uh, it's, it's a fairly recent phenomenon. 
And the reason for that is that up until, I, I forget, it was, was it uh, 1929 or 30, uh, American companies weren't required and, and didn't necessarily release their accounts to the public. So when people bought and sold stocks or bonds, they didn't really have any good data to base those decisions upon. And they didn't have a good way of comparing one company to another because there were no publicly available accounts. They just um, essentially kind of said, well, I like buying a Ford car, so I'll invest in the Ford Motor Company. And that that was the extent of the decision. And so once companies started uh, preparing uh, financial statements or were required to prepare them by uh, by regulators, then people started analyzing that data and using it to make decisions as to how they should invest. And so that's what we call fundamental analysis. So there's a whole bunch of different approaches to fundamental analysis and different people have different approaches. So we've got things here like discounted cash flow ratio analysis, comparables analysis, growth investing, value investing, uh, investing in high dividend stocks, uh, stock buybacks as a predictor of future returns, uh, event-driven trading, uh, uh, positioning in the business cycle, activist investing, all these different ideas that we'll talk about in, in the rest of this video. And um, and these are the sort of approaches to, to fundamental analysis, which is really just deciding on the value of a company or which company to invest in based on fundamental uh, information that comes out in, in the accounts of these companies. So the first thing we'll talk about, one of the earlier ideas in fundamental investing is the dividend discount method. And the dividend discount method, at first it might not make a ton of sense to you, but the idea behind this is that when you invest in a company, if you, we, we know if you invest in a bond, that what you get are the coupon payments of that bond. And so if you invest in a stock, what does an investor actually get? And what they get is the dividends of that stock, right? So the idea of the dividend discount method is quite simply that if all you get are dividends, then the value of the company must be the present value of those dividends. So you basically take whatever the, the given the, the current dividend is right now, you project its growth into the future, and then you uh, you discount those dividends, uh, you know, you, you adjust for the time value of money. And that is the value of uh, of the company. So that is that's the di dividend discount method. It, it sort of makes sense a little bit. A stock's value is the present value of its future expected cash flows, and the cash flows are the dividends. But there's a few problems in there. So. It doesn't work for non-dividend paying stocks, right? And there's lots of good companies that you might want to own that don't necessarily pay a dividend. And, and I don't even mean ones that are in this rate of high growth right now um, that, that don't pay dividends, but there are just certain companies that might never pay a dividend. Um, and so in, in a case like that, you would argue that the company is worth nothing. But of course, that's not really reasonable because, the, of course, if the company has economic activity and you are a proportional owner of, we'll say, the, the assets of that company, that has a value itself. Um, other problems with the dividend discount method is that it's extremely sensitive to a small number of assumptions. So there's only a few things that you're going to put into the analysis and all of them will really move the needle in terms of valuation. So the problem is that it, uh, you know, it's, it's very sensitive to these assumptions. Um, so while this method might provide some interesting brackets around the potential valuation figures, it's not necessarily hugely useful in, in practice. Um, we do see non-dividend paying stocks trading in the market all the time, and of course they have value. And in fact, there are many companies and they do stock buybacks instead of paying dividends. And you know that, that's economically the same thing. You often hear in the press, they say, oh, companies shouldn't be allowed to do buybacks. Well, a buyback is in truth no different than a dividend. But, um, but anyhow, um, you know, often a company will just do that because uh, it's, it's incentivized to do so by the, the tax uh, system. But um, 
you know, if a company says it will never pay dividends, its shares would be worthless. Uh, but the, the counter argument to that is that even if the company is not paying dividend and, uh, dividends and it doesn't look like it will in the future, eventually you would expect at some point, like if you go long enough into the future, you would expect some sort of liquidating dividend or something. And so that, that would be the argument that yes, you can value this company using that method, but the problem is that it's difficult to do so because we don't know how big this eventual liquidating dividend will be or when it will come but uh, you know if, if you knew that uh, maybe this method would work um, other problems with it well the dividend discount method requires an awful lot of speculation in trying to forecast future dividends you know which is it sort of sounds like it might be easy but it's not and in a funny way the problem with some of these methods is that they are almost tied to if you think it's a good stock you think its earnings will go up and you think its dividends will go up. And if you think it's a bad stock, you think its earnings won't go up and its dividends won't go up. And so you built maybe a very complicated approach to uh, expressing your point of view where you just think it's a good stock or a bad stock. And so that's kind of a problem. Um, even when you apply it to very steady, reliable, dividend-paying companies, um, there are so many assumptions about the future that, that, that it's questionable value added, this analysis. And the model is very, uh, you know, well, like all financial models, it's subject to this kind of garbage in, garbage out issue in that a model is only as good as the inputs. And if your inputs aren't very good, uh, then the output won't be very good or won't be very useful. Um, and the inputs that do provide valuations are always changing and so therefore it's very susceptible to error so that is the dividend discount method and it's kind of a, a an interesting idea i suppose around how you value a company now the next approach is a much more widely used approach and that is what's called the discounted cash flow model and in truth it's not just more widely used it's probably the most widely uh used approach to valuing companies. And so the idea behind the discounted cash flow model is to uh, compile company performance assumptions, use historical cash flows, growth rate assumptions to project future cash flows, and then you present value them at the appropriate discount rate. So the idea with this is that if you are the owner of a company, you, you eventually, one way or another, get whatever the cash flows of the company is. And so an asset is worth the present value of its cash flow. So the company is worth the present value of its expected cash flows. So then you take some historic... Um, uh, accounting data and you project it forwards and you, you you have to make all sorts of assumptions you build a big model which usually is complicated and difficult to build um, but you basically put down all of your assumptions about the company and how it will do and then you you project the cash flows that will come from that and then discount them and that'll give you the value of the company um, this is extensively used it's probably the most used and it's used by investment bankers it's in order to price a company for a merger and acquisition it's used by analysts trying to price the equity of a stock that's trading in the market right now it's used by the owners of companies to justify the valuation of their company and so all of you know this is the the bread and butter in truth of uh, an investment analyst is doing this kind of research now it's not easy to do just to be clear because often people think oh yeah you just take the accounts and project them forward how do you do that well let's think a little I, I did work for a while as an equity analyst and so I can give you a little bit of insight into this so Usually what you do is you look at the historic data and you build, a, you build out some accounts and then you start projecting them forward. And how you project them forward is that you look at almost each product that the company makes and you perform a, an analysis and try and come up with justifiable uh, demand for that product going forward. So the, the kind of stocks that I used to value in this method were pharmaceutical stocks. And what I would do is I'd look at each drug that the company currently made, and then I'd also look at the ones that were in development, and you'd have to assess how likely that drug that's in development is to make it through FDA approval and to, to market, and then you'd decide how quickly 
the the share of the mar uh, uh, how quickly that new compound would take on market share and that's a big job and it involves making all sorts of phone calls to doctors and asking them how they prescribe and what they do right now and what would make them consider changing from using drug a to drug b and you know and you do all of this work drug by drug in order to then value the pharmaceutical company and that's that's a fair bit of work even i i remember one time i was i was trying to value a company that was uh, developing an arthritis uh, drug and you know the step one was to look at demographics and i looked at what percentage of the population ever get arthritis then you want to look at what percentage of the population can afford to pay for medicine right because if you get arthritis and you can't buy medicine for it, it, it it'll they'll never sell this drug right and so what percentage of people can afford to buy medicine for arthritis and then you're looking at all sorts of things like age ranges and so on and you know as a population ages it's more likely to uh, develop certain illnesses and therefore to, uh, to to have a need for these compounds and so on so it's not like a you know you're not just sort of applying a growth rate to existing products you're actually really digging into the nuts and bolts of how the economy works around these uh, these types of investment that is the work of an investment analyst and if ever you speak to an investment analyst at one of the big investment banks or at an asset management company you might actually be surprised by how deep their expertise is and often uh, you know the kind of person who'll be analyzing um We'll say, for example, an engineering firm probably is a qualified engineer. The kind of people that were working in the pharmaceutical space, you know, when I would call up the guy at a big bank uh, who was the, the equity analyst covering some of these pharma stocks that I was analyzing, they were usually people with a PhD in uh, biochemistry or something like that. And they really understood these things. They understood how all the legal systems and everything worked around drug approval. So it's 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 a big job doing fundamental analysis well um so anyhow that is a discounted cash flow model that's kind of what people do so with a discounted cash flow model you're discounting the cash flows at the weighted average cost of capital and that will value the whole company and from that then you'll subtract out uh, things like the value of the bonds and any other hybrid instruments to be left with the value of the equity another approach is to is to uh, discount the um the the cash flow to equity and you'll discount that at the cost of equity and that will give you the the value of the overall equity in that company as well so that is how it is calculated um, here's kind of a this slide is just a quick example of what a DCF model looks like and so as you can see here we've got a few years in this example two years of historic um, uh, accounts and then we've got all of the other ones have an E after them which is sort of estimated or projected uh, cash flows and so you're projecting all of the accounts out into the future usually what you'll do is you'll project a number of years into the future we'll say five or ten years and then you'll assume maybe a steady state of growth after that point um, it depends on the type of company as well because you know if it's a very predictable company you might be able to just kind of do five years of uh, of year by year projections and then just assume everything grows at a given growth rate uh, what if it's a kind of a really new growth stock uh, you know something that could grow an awful lot uh, but then we'll have to slow down eventually like a, we'll say if uh, it was five or ten years ago and you were analyzing something like Facebook um, you know you might you 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 might uh, have staged uh, growth phases you know where you say well we'll predict five years of actual data then after that we'll assume it grows at this percentage for the next five years and then we'll say that it's at its sort of uh, the the growth rate at that point will slow down to much more of a steady state growth rate so there's many ways of doing this um, you basically project all of this data present value all of the cash flows and that should give you 
the, uh, the value of the company. Now, an important point with this is that there's usually always a sensitivity analysis in there because a, a DCF model is very sensitive to certain figures that you use, one of which is the, the cost of capital, whether it's the cost of equity or the weighted average cost of capital that you're using. And, you know, moving that by even small amounts will move the value of the company rather significantly. So as you can see here, we've got this little box that's sensitivity analysis, and we're adjusting for different weighted average cost of capitals here. And then we've got different perpetual growth rates because the terminal rate of growth that you assume will have a huge impact on the value of the company. So we play around with those. We have a sensitivity analysis there. And what this is then giving us is, you know, in, in this analysis, it's telling us that the value per share is four dollars and eleven cents but as you can see over here there's a big range you know it can be anything between uh what have we got here three dollars and seven cents up to five dollars and 89 cents depending on which weighted average cost of capital or which perpetual growth rate you use for that stock so hopefully that is useful and makes sense to you so once again the problem with discounted cash flow is that it suffers from this garbage in garbage out problem and you're going to get used to hearing me say that because that's kind of the problem with almost everything that you do in the finance world is that if the numbers you put into a formula are no good the numbers that come out will be no good as well so um, that's a big issue it's very sensitive to assumed growth rates to required rate of return and to the free cash flow used at the starting point of the stable phase and so so as I mentioned, sensitivity analysis is necessary because to just come to one value is maybe not that useful. The truth is there's a, it's, it's more useful to come up with a range of reasonable values. Now, what can be done with this? Well, even if you're not in love with, with the fact that you can... One of the problems I would say is that for any student who's ever built one of these models, often you'll sit down and you'll, you'll build your first DCF model and it'll come up with a value. And you might look at it and say, well, so my analysis says that this company should be trading at $50 a share, but it's actually trading at $10 a share. Should I rush out and buy it? It's, it's trading at 120, uh, you know, it's, it's trading way cheaper than it should, right? And so, um, so what, what do we do with that? Well, often then what you'll decide is the problem is that maybe your assumptions were a bit aggressive, you know, so you'll keep toning them down. And that's sort of the process that, that you'll find happens with this kind of analysis. And then if you're going to do that, the question is, well, what good is the analysis at all? Well, I would argue that one of the uses of this analysis, or at least how I've seen it used by, uh, by portfolio managers, is that if you did build a model like that and you actually just reverse engineered the model to give you the price that the stock is trading at right now, then it at least might be useful for, uh, for, for updating the model when new information comes out, right? So we'll say, for example, if you've built a model, if the sh shares are trading at $20 a share and you've reverse engineered your model to give you a value of $20 a share and you're on the earnings call and the CEO says, well, actually, you know, product B is selling twice as well as we thought it would. You can update your spreadsheet quickly with the the, the new growth rate or with the new sales rate of that given product and that will tell you how much the share price should move now if the share price moves up more than that amount maybe people are overreacting to the news if the share price doesn't move up enough maybe people are underreacting to the news so even even if you um don't believe in the sort of pure beauty of the model that you have built in terms of if it's saying that it's it's worth fifty dollars a share and it's actually trading at ten dollars a share if you decide that therefore the the whole approach is useless you know you can decide that but equally the other the other idea is just that you uh you know that that the model at least if it's just calibrated to where the market is right now it can provide you useful information as to how new news could be incorporated into the stock price so i'll i'll leave you with with that idea
So the next thing we're going to talk about is ratio analysis. And I'm sure many of you have heard of this approach as well. And this is, there's a whole bunch of ratios out there, things like PE ratio, which is price to earnings, price to book ratios, EV over EBITDA, dividend over price. There's all sorts of uh, ratios. You can calculate it anything. Uh, I remember back in the dot-com boom of the late 1990s, uh, there were all these high growth, uh, you know, internet stocks. And of course, you know, they didn't have any earnings. So you, a lot of this ratio analysis didn't work. And there were analysts who came up with things like the price to clicks ratio that basically tried to say that you could price an internet stock based on how many people were on that website uh, compared to other websites, right? And so there's all kinds of ratios. There's, there's the well-known ones that you can find in any finance textbook, but you can also come up with your own stuff as well. Um, so price earnings is kind of one of the better known ones. And many years ago, uh, back when I worked with Vic Niederhofer, we did a big analysis. And Victor used to write these, uh, these articles, I think it was on Microsoft Money Central at the time. And we would do all this analysis and write these articles. And I remember doing an analysis on price to earnings ratio. And essentially, I found that it wasn't really predictive of anything like the cheap stocks didn't necessarily do well and the expensive stocks didn't underperform. It, it didn't seem that useful to me. Now, you know, you can do your own research and see if, uh, if you can find something better than I did. Equally, what I'm telling you about is uh, analysis I did 15 years ago. Um, but you know, one of the problems with these things is that they're so picked over, like every everyone on, on the street is looking at them, and so maybe they're less useful. A lot of this stuff came from a book, the Graham and Dodd book, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, I forget, it's it's kind of Warren Buffett's favorite uh, book. It might be called Security Analysis or something like that. I'll Maybe I'll put a link to that in the description below as well. And, you know, that was actually, I mean, you know, there's a lot of people would argue that that book is just out of date at this point of view, but it was written, I don't know, was it, uh, gosh, it's like, uh, I don't know, I, I think it was written in the 1930s or something like that. It's It's an old book on pricing stocks. And in many ways, you could argue that this was the earliest approach to fundamental analysis, you know. So these guys came up with the idea that you should look at this sort of stuff before anyone had an approach like this. So um, many of these approaches probably worked quite well back then because you were able to analyze and compare the price of one stock to another in a fundamental way that other investors weren't doing at the time. And maybe as more and more people started doing that, the prices started adjusting and and giving you a, a profit associated with your early adoption of this approach. Um, and so, as I say here, it was revolutionary and effective at the time. And, uh, you know, that that's true. And people like Warren Buffett would tell you to this day, it's the best approach. And and he sure has good returns, so maybe he's right about that. But there's equally, I would say, lots of people who tried this and don't do that well. And I think Warren Buffett might tell you, well, they don't try as hard as he does. But anyhow, um, some of the problem is that maybe at this point, like very simple analysis, like pr simple ratio analysis, the problem with it is that, uh, that, that too many people are looking at it. And even just E, you know, price to earnings, the E, the earnings, is so biased and smoothed by accounting that it's not really comparable. So even if you look at two companies that are in the same business, like Coca-Cola and Pepsi, for example, and you calculate their price to earnings ratios, the way their accounts are put together is so different that, you know, yes, you'll come up with two different numbers and you could decide that one is cheap compared to the other. But the, the question is, are the numbers you're looking at reflective of the businesses or are they, uh, uh, you know, sort of so convoluted that, that it's not a reasonable comparable? Um, but anyhow, that is the idea of ratio analysis. And so this type of approach, of course, is widely used by investors and it's equally widely used in corporate finance. And so this is an example of the kind of sheet that an investment banker might put together. And we've got here a bunch of retail stocks. You've got things like Tesco, Target, Safeway, Kroger, um, Carrefour, all of these big sort of supermarket companies. And then we've got all of their different ratios up here. And we kind of look at 
if you were trying to, we'll say if you were IPOing a grocery company stock, you might look at all of these and say, well, if we're going to IPO it, we'll have to IPO it with a PE ratio that's within the range of these comparables and, and that has a price to book and an EV to EBITDA and all of those other ratios so that we can't sort of have a, a, a we, we can't IPO it at a price that's way outside of the range of all of the other similar companies. And, uh, you know, so there is something reasonable about this approach. Um, what else have we got? So that brings us to value investing. We're going to talk with this slide on value investing and the next one is on growth investing. And so value investing is um, an investment philosophy where you're seeking cheap stocks. You're trying to work out which stocks are cheap and which ones are expensive. And then you then want to buy the cheap ones with the idea that they'll eventually become fair value. And so you can look at all sorts of, you build a DCF model and price the stock. And if, if the price you come to is higher than what it's trading at in the market right now, maybe it's a cheap stock. Um, you might look at ratios, all sorts of things. You know, you can look at this slide and there's a whole bunch of different ratios and rules that might be in there for a value investor. And there's always this idea of margin of safety as well. And so, as I mentioned, Warren Buffett is probably the most famous value investor, but there's a bunch of other ones as well. And, um, and the idea is that you try and find cheap stocks and buy them. And that is what value investing is all about. Now, often, trying to find cheap stocks involves finding sort of out of favor stocks because that's how a stock would maybe get to be cheap is just that the uh you know the the world isn't focusing on that area at a given point in time so i think if you looked for value stocks in this current environment there's a lot of banks and energy companies in there and so um and in, in truth in recent years uh, you know probably since the credit crunch in fact value has not really performed awfully well and growth has done awfully well now I would argue that this often changes, you know, in any period when value is underperformed and growth has done well, often later it flips in the other direction and it, it goes back and forth, you know, growth has done awfully well because a lot of these kind of uh, modern technology companies, things like Netflix and so on, they are, uh, you know, people are buying them like pe people are using their their service and they're paying up for it and you know the beauty of these kind of software type companies is that they don't have to you know if you, if you develop one piece of software if you sell five copies it doesn't cost any more to sell five million copies is to sell five copies usually and so these are very scalable and and uh, have at least in recent years been uh, very profitable areas to uh, to be in in the economy that we're in um, and so we'll have to see how things uh, continue on but that is value investing and so then the other side of the coin is growth investing, which, as I just mentioned, has done quite well uh, in the last decade. And the idea here is that you don't worry as much about finding cheap stocks. What you try and find is just stocks that are growing, businesses that are doing well. And uh, so you'll look at all sorts of different metrics in order to find a good growth stock. Um, it's much more forward looking as, as, a, as opposed to being value focused. So instead of saying like, is this stock cheap? You're really just saying like, what area of the economy is going to really grow in the in the coming years and what are the exciting things that we should invest in and there's some people you know I, I as I argued early on there are some people and they are really good at and they really care about kind of picking trends like picking ideas that are are growing and will continue to grow and there's other people and they're really good at uh, you know, if you if you think about it in terms of how you spend your money, there's some people and they're good at kind of picking through discount stores and getting great bargains. And there's other people that are great at picking the clothes that will be fashionable in the coming year, you know. And it, it, depending on which you are, growth or value might appeal more to you. Um, so 
it, it, this is another approach. It's worked very well historically and it works well right now. Uh, but one of the problems is, of course, that some of these investors, they often find themselves fully invested at market peaks. You know, they're in the hottest stocks that have run up the most. And so maybe when the market turns around there, in uh, you know some of the most overvalued companies, uh, which which can be a problem, but uh, that's that. And so we've got here T Rowe Price is kind of one of the famous uh, growth investors. And so yeah, this is sort of the idea of uh, of the life cycle of an industry. And so we've got here this sort of rapid growth phase in the early introduction and growth. And so the idea is that a growth investor wants to capture this part that the the big growth in the company now you might see this maturity and decline and say to yourself well you wouldn't want to be invested in that but of course you might want to be if it's cheap enough right because even even a company that's selling less and less stuff over time if it's worth the present value of its cash flows as long as there still are cash flows the company is value because you'd like to capture those cash flows and so if the company is cheap enough even if it's in a declining business you can still make money out of that and you you i'm sure you can think of many businesses like that like we'll say for example even things like the mechanical watches right like that's a technology that's well out of date at, at this point in time it's 50 years out of date but still people want to buy them and people spend money servicing them and so on and so if you're a watch repairman you could argue that this is a, a business that time has come and gone but equally there are people out there who have expensive watches that will pay you to service them and so it, it still might be a good business even if it's in a in a decline um, so that is industry life cycle and so obviously a, a growth investor would probably be most focused on this introduction and growth phase and a value investor might find himself invested more in mature or declining industries but where the price that the price that they get in at is good enough to make uh, make it still a good investment and actually it's worth um you know there was a, a phrase that benjamin graham uh, warren buffett's mentor uh, um used to use to describe some of these companies he called them cigar butt companies and, the, and he used to explain that uh, you know, sometimes if you're walking around the street, it, I wouldn't advise this, especially in an era of coronavirus, but, you know, um, uh, Benjamin Graham used to say, you know, you might see a sort of a, the stub of a cigar lying on the sidewalk and there's still a few puffs left in it. You could pick it up and get a bit of a smoke out of it. And his idea was that companies are like that as well, that just because a company is in decline or not doing well, doesn't mean that there's not a bit of juice left to be squeezed out of it. And so that's often the, the difference, I guess, in the focus between a value and a growth investor. Um, so a growth investor, even though a company might be recognized as a growth company, its price might already affect that, right? So price is still gonna play into whether it's a growth or a value company. And so even if it has high growth, if, if it's so expensive that it reflects those high growth rates, maybe it's not that great investment. Um, and so you still always do probably have to take some sort of valuation metrics into account, even with that focus. The next thing we'll talk about here is dividend investing. And it's the idea that there's a lot of investors and they just like to invest in high dividend stocks. I have a friend who does this and every year he tells me, no, no, I don't need a, an investment guy like you. All I do is I buy whatever the five stocks in the Dow Jones index are that have the highest dividend yield. And then I rebalance once a year. I think that strategy is called dogs of the Dow or something like that. You can, you can Google it. Um, but anyhow, that's what this friend of mine does. And you know, that is an approach that a lot of people take and they just like a high dividend stock. And so what I've done here, I do this every year when I teach this class, I bring up a, a list, you can Google for it and just find a list of the highest dividend paying stocks uh, available in the market right now. And we've got one here, WHD, Westwood Holding Groups, and they've got a dividend yield of 10%. 
IRM, which is Iron Mountain, has a dividend yield of 8.08% and so on. So there's big dividend yields available out there. And so that's something that you, you could invest in if, if that uh, approach appeals to you. But one of the problems with investing on dividend yield is, of course, that sometimes as the share price of a company is falling, the dividend yield looks better and better. So in this slide here, we've got a, an annual dividend of $1. And as the price falls from 50 to 45 to 40 and all the way down to 20, the dividend yield does go up. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is, will the dividend eventually get cut? Because maybe what's happened is that the business is not doing well and therefore the dividend yield is sort of a historic artifact rather than uh, you know something that indicates a healthy business model. And so one of the risks is that you're always catching falling knives, you know, that you're buying these stocks on their way down. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to analyze these because if you look up the highest dividend yielding stocks, you need to, of course, take into account the ones from prior years that did go bankrupt because some of them will and so what I do is you know I put together every year that list of the highest dividend paying stocks and then I look at last year's ones and how they did so last year's two highest dividend payers were the Credit Suisse uh, crude oil ETN and Blue Knight Energy Partners Limited and these are their stock prices and as you can see over the last 12 months both of them have, have fallen fairly significantly so last year that approach wouldn't have worked. Uh, what else have we got? So takeover targets. So there's a lot of investors and they like to invest in companies that they think are likely to be taken over. And I, I think one of the books I mentioned in, in last week's, or yeah, in, in the class number one was by Ivan Bosky. And, you know, he, he was a merger ARB investor. He, he turned out to be an insider trader, but he claimed his ability was to find these takeover targets and invest before the, the news came out. Um, and so there's a lot of people who do try without insider trading to uh, to make these kinds of investments. And they just say, well, you know, sometimes there's a period of con consolidation in a given industry. And if, if one or two companies merge, more will. And then you just have to look at the stocks and say, well, which is the next one? Like, which will people want to buy next? And so that's what they do. And so we're going to talk about what makes a company a good target and how do highly acquisitive stocks perform. So this is just a, a, a Bloomberg chart of a, a company, SAF, which was a, a, a company that was bought out. And as you can see here, on the day the takeover was announced, it jumped by 45.5%. So big, big price spike associated with this. So obviously, if you had been able to predict that and to get in before... Uh, the announcement, if you just realized that this company was maybe cheap and that one of its competitors might want to buy it out, uh, in theory, you could have invested and, and maybe made this big return. Of course, that's what people are trying to get. Um, they don't always get that, though. Um, so, uh, so that is an approach that investors do take. They'll do all sorts of analysis. They'll look at, we'll say, for example, private equity firms. If there's a load of money going into private equity and they're all excited about one given sector, maybe you buy the sort of what look like the cheap stocks in that sector and hope that someone comes in and decides to buy them up. And so that's an approach to investing. Credit risk um, is our next approach we've got here. So equity has subordinated claims to a company's cash flows and credit health matters. So there are certain investors and they'll look at the kind of things that relate to bonds and try and use that analysis in order to invest in, um, to, to invest in equity. There's things like the Altman Z-score, uh, which is a measure that's used to analyze credit risk, but equally equity investors will look at that kind of thing as well in order Order to decide what stocks to buy. Next thing up is activist investing. And this is a type of investing which is sort of almost the polar opposite of passive investing. Well, in, in name as well, I guess. And uh, activist investing is this idea that 
that an investor can take a big position in a company and then can agitate for change. And it, you know, if they if they look at a company and they say it's doing badly for a variety of reasons, they'll take a big position in it and then say we need to change the board of direction, change the management, and we need to do something about the business model and make this a better company. And so there's good examples of that. You know, there was a funny one, I guess, about five or six years ago where um, an activist investor got involved with uh, Olive Garden, the restaurant chain in the United States. They, they bought a big share and then they, they published, you know, you could find it on the internet, uh, their, their list of the problems associated with Olive Garden. And amongst them were things like not putting enough salt in the water that's used to cook the pasta and so on. So not only did they feel there might have needed to be financial changes, but they also wanted some recipe changes as well. Um, but that's the idea of activist investing is that not only do you, you don't just invest and hope that things get better you invest and if you have a big enough share you get to petition either the other shareholders or the management or whoever you might want to and ask them to change to make changes that will make the company more valuable and there's many ways this can be done uh, there's even things like ethical investors who might get involved in the, this and try and say that we'll say if you change the way your company is run uh, in terms of we'll say uh, environmental friendliness or whatever maybe that will increase the value of the company it'll be both good for you know socially good and equally economically good and so there's all sorts of things um, this has become a bigger and bigger space in recent years you know 20 years ago this was unheard of now it's a big thing and you know one of the biggest names in that space is Carl Icahn um, okay what else so things you might want to think about as an equity investor are things like how does a firm really make its money and I've got here the example of Enron and of course Enron was a big stock scandal back uh, probably 20 years ago and you know Enron seemed to be doing awfully well people didn't fully understand why they were doing well and then it turned out to be a, a big fraud basically and if you want to watch a film on that topic uh, there's a film called The uh, Smartest Guys in the Room which is the story of the Enron scandal. Um, business model sustainability, this is a big deal. I remember back in the late 90s, once again, there were a lot of IPOs of these sort of uh, telephone directory uh, you know, yellow pages and things like that. And I remember at the time thinking, well, you know, why would anyone want the yellow pages? You can use the internet to find the phone number of your local plumber or restaurant or where, whatever it might be. But at the time, you know, a lot of the investing public, they were significantly older than me and they didn't necessarily think this internet thing was going to catch on. And the yellow pages was where companies bought advertising, you know, local advertising for local businesses. And so, of course, the problem with, the, you know, now the, you know, the phone directory arrives at your house and you put it straight into the recycle bin without looking at it. But, you know, 20 years ago, that was kind of how people found uh, businesses. Um, other things like the ease of competitors entering the space of a business, you know, and I give the example here of the restaurant business. And, you know, one of the difficulties of a restaurant is, of course, that we'll, we'll say if you come up with the best new recipe, the problem is that the restaurant next door can come up with that uh, or can copy it. And, and soon you're in, you're always in a very competitive business. And, you know, living in London, I often I, I used to love, you know, going to good coffee shops and kind of five, ten years ago, there were five or six good coffee shops in London and you'd seek them out and you'd find them and they were great you know and now I walk around London and there's good coffee on every corner and it, it has to be a much more difficult business now like you used to travel to get a good coffee and now it's everywhere you know um, so one of the problems with certain businesses is that if, if even if they do come up with something cool if there's no barriers to entry to that business a competitor can just quickly appear and uh, and take away all their business um what else have we got so so ultimately fundamental investors back ideas and business models where they understand value generation they understand where the money is coming from and why it's likely to continue to flow in
Um, famous stock pickers. So I've just got a list here of kind of well-known stock pickers. I won't necessarily go through it, but one of the things that's worth looking at is that not only are there these famous stock pickers, but a lot of them have books. And when I started out in this industry, I just read all of these uh, famous investors' books and it taught me what they do and how they think. And so I would recommend that to you guys as well. And I'll try and put some I, I lecture one I put a bunch of links in the description and I realized since then that I have many more that I could put in so I'll, I'll give maybe more uh, more recommendations at the end of this lecture um, there's also a bunch of stock picking services available you know you can buy in analysis uh, you know if you're a professional investor you often get a lot of this uh, equity analysis from the big investment banks out there who do this uh, but also there's all these firms like there's websites and there's a uh, you know value line hold barra uh, all of these different stock picking services that are out there that that investors often do use so our last little bit of the day will be on the topic of technical analysis, which is basically looking at often price and volume data uh, from a stock and using that to try and predict uh, future stock prices and there's uh, you know hundreds of approaches and there's hundreds of books out there on this topic and uh, you know a lot of these people feel that there are certain chart formations that just repeat themselves so once you see this thing happening you know what the next thing is going to be and, and that is the idea behind technical analysis um, so Actually, one of the first things I did when I started working many years ago for Vic Niederhofer, who was a quantitative analyst, is I got a book on what they call Japanese candlestick uh, patterns. And the, the beauty of those is a candlestick is the daily open, high, low, close uh, price. It's, it's these little bars that you see here. And of course, that's easy data to download into Excel and to test. So I spent probably three months testing these kind of patterns to see which ones work and which ones don't work. Unfortunately, I found that most of them were random. And in, in a funny way, there's almost, a, you know, different people have different approaches, but there's, a, you know, to a certain extent, I would argue that a lot of the information that's out there on technical analysis is a bit like homeopathy, you know, where they kind of tell you this thing is guaranteed to work, it always works. And if you test it, you find that it, it doesn't necessarily. And, um, you know, uh, as I said, there's different approaches. There's this candlestick approach, there's Dow theory, there's other things, uh, what have we got, Elliott Wave, GAN angles, Bollinger Bands, all of these different approaches. And often these things are built into a lot of your charting software that you'll find, you know, you can you can run all of this analysis on Bloomberg terminals or even on, uh, you know, Yahoo Finance and things like that. Uh, the problem is that often this stuff doesn't back test very well. And I would argue one of the reasons that it doesn't is uh, this is sort of a, an argument that I take from my old boss Victor Niederhofer um, it's this argument that if something did work right if something repetitively if it always worked what happens is that people notice it right because there's an awful lot of smart people in the world of investing and there's all these sort of physics PhDs out there building computer programs to analyze every move in the market and if if you don't believe that you you need to meet some of these people like they they're very smart people with amazing analytical abilities and they're going through all of this stuff trying to find what works and if they find something that works they do it to death you know now the problem as Vic Niederhofer would point out is that of course if you can find something like this that does work what will happen is that people will start putting money behind it so we'll say for example if there was a very simple idea that the stock market always went up on a Friday right if that was your technical analysis pattern what would happen is that people would start buying at the open of the day on Friday and selling at the close of the day on Friday. And of course, that buying would push up 
the the price at the start and push down the price at the end and so suddenly something that did work no longer works because of people who are involved so then you'd need to start buying on a thursday in order to get the friday move and maybe you'd want to buy on thursday and sell on monday and eventually you'd find that the exact opposite approach worked where you wanted to be selling at the open on friday and buying at the close and so this is the problem is that any fixed system probably can't work in the long run in markets just because when people start trading it their trades move the market the market changes and uh, and new ideas are needed and so i would argue that one of the ways to be successful in markets is to always be coming up with new ideas because basically what is rewarded in in finance and probably in almost every industry is creativity it's doing new stuff and coming up with new ideas and actually the most successful people i've met in markets are just really creative minds like they come up with a new idea every few minutes you know and they test it and work out what works and they do it till it doesn't work and then they've got a new idea and and that's probably the way it works in every business um so that's my argument against uh, fixed systems is that they probably it's probably not reasonable to expect a fixed system to to always work that you could come up with one idea and spend the next 40 years of your life monetizing it doesn't work that way you're going to need some new ideas over time um that, then we reach finally the passive investment philosophy and this is the indexing argument and the indexing argument is that all of the stuff I've talked about up until now you shouldn't worry about just buy the stock market just buy an S&P 500 tracker fund and stick in it and you'll be fine you'll get the average return you don't need to try and outperform because whenever you're trying to outperform you're risking underperforming and maybe you should be happy with the average return and you know there's a good argument for that and in particular for a lot of investors like if if my mom said to me should i be building dcf models and working out what stocks to buy i would tell her no buy an index fund you know just that they, they tend to be very cheap investments and uh, you know in the long run you should do all right you'll be you'll be exposed to business right you've you've bought equity which is ownership of partial ownership of a whole bunch of different businesses and if business does well, you'll do well. And that's probably good enough. And that is the argument for passive investing. Then there's all these exchange traded funds. Now, historically, passive investing used to involve a mutual fund. Nowadays, it seems to have moved much toward more in the direction of ETFs, uh, where you invest in an, uh, an exchange traded fund, which will track one of these big indexes. Um, and so here we've got a bunch of the tickers of some of the biggest ones and they're they're big you know the s p tracker one the, the spy they call it the spiders is probably the biggest one and there's a whole bunch of them there's a you know s p one a nasdaq one a dow jones one there's mid cap small cap total index ones there's all sorts of things um and so finally the argument here on uh, asset versus pack passive investing is tied to this idea of alpha versus beta do you want alpha like are you going to try and outperform the market or are you happy with beta to just get the return of the market and for most people the answer probably is beta and in particular when you think of the effort involved in trying to outperform and when you see how few people actually do outperform in particular after fees maybe maybe this is a reasonable approach but as i said there there sort of is a chicken egg problem in, in that if everyone was a passive investor then no one would be doing security analysis and then there would probably be a lot of value associated with doing security analysis it almost goes back to that idea of in the 1920s when there were no accounts and so you couldn't compare companies and you know if you were one of the first people who was doing this work there was great value and so if everyone's going to stop doing this work maybe this work becomes valuable again or at least some one has to be doing it in order for the efficient markets hypothesis to hold um, so in conclusion traditional asset management seeks to gain 
the smartest beta exposures possible through sophisticated analysis. So that's what you're really doing is you're trying to get market exposure because we're talking about traditional asset management here, which is sort of long only investments. And uh, there's numerous approaches. Like I've walked you through a few. There's 10 times as many as I've talked about, but I've just tried to bring up sort of the big ideas in the space. And, uh, you know, some people choose to do a lot of this work in order to outperform. There's other people who are happy with the average performance and they'll invest in an index fund. Obviously, if your goal is to work in finance, you probably want to try and find something to, that works. And the way to do that is to work hard. That That's where good things come from is hard work. So on that note, I'll let you go and tune in tomorrow for another video on fixed income. See you then. Bye.